Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 39, December 13th through December 19th, 1861. Last week, we had a bit of a busier schedule than one could expect for December. We headed out to Oklahoma and checked back in on West Virginia. In addition, we were also able to wrap up Ball's Bluff with a discussion on the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War, which will be examining performances moving forward. I think it is also important, as mentioned last week, because it does illustrate the power that Edwin Stan would come to wield. Keep in mind, he is not quite there yet. He is not the Secretary of War, but that is right here around the corner. It should come as no shock, but it is also a good example of the growing dissatisfaction with George B. McClellan, who throughout everything will still be increasingly stubborn, it must be said. Speaking of Little Mac, I want to begin this week actually with a look into the Army of the Potomac as it has been formed during these months. So far, we have already had an Army of the Potomac, but this army was Confederate. The Union Army of the Potomac would be formed with what remained of the Army of Northeastern Virginia and the Department of the Shenandoah. Northeastern Virginia, as we might recall, was the army name for the troops under Irvin McDowell at Bull Run. The Department of the Shenandoah was under one Nathaniel P. Banks, but would merge in July of 1861 to create the new fighting force. Banks is another interesting Civil War figure. He was a former congressman and governor from Massachusetts. A Republican, he was given a major generalship early in the war, but his was not a story of battlefield success. Banks will serve in the Shenandoah and be the primary opponent to Stonewall Jackson before moving to command the Department of the Gulf. It is under Banks where African-American troops first see combat during the war. Banks unfortunately would end his military career with the failure in the Red River campaign before returning to Congress after the war and becoming a liberal Republican. Anyway, it would surprise you maybe to know that the original organization of the Army of the Potomac was made up of some 15 divisions. It would not be until Lincoln's 1862 initiative that the army be further divided into corps that the more iconic shape of the Army of the Potomac would form. McClellan opposed this idea at first, which is a great example of the difficulty and the divide that McClellan would create. You might ask, though, why exactly there was this resistance to the creation of corps. While it was true European armies had been operated under that system, American armies had never been large enough for their creation. McClellan was using a more dated methodology, as well as drawing off his experience from the Mexican-American War, which we have highlighted had a large discrepancy in the amount of troops deployed. Keep in mind, there are large amounts of recruits that are coming in. Enlistment periods have come to a close for shorter time frames, while longer ones are filling the new armies. McClellan is also a Democrat, and he feared the use of Republican generals as his core commanders, who would potentially undermine and sabotage his genius. The counterpart to the Army of the Potomac, the Army of Northern Virginia, does not really get formed until 1862. So the Union Army of the Potomac, I think, is a little special in that it outlives the Army of Northern Virginia, which will be its primary opponent. The famous Union Army of Tennessee was being formed during this time, but was not titled as such until 1862. And this would be Grant's army, by the way. The Confederate counterpart is also confusingly the Army of Tennessee, and that is formed under Bragg, also in 1862. His main opponent, the Army of the Cumberland, would likewise be formed once again in 1862. 
The Army of the Mississippi will soon be taking shape under Albert Sidney Johnson. Needless to say, as I have maybe said before, we are trying to put everything together. All the pieces are on the board, as it were. I hope to continue discussions in the next couple of weeks to talk about famous units, especially in the Army of the Potomac. I think this is also as good a time as any to talk about the Urbana plan and McClellan's difficulty with Abraham Lincoln. While these conversations would not take place until early January of 1862, just know that the pressure has been building. McClellan has been difficult working with Lincoln. Lincoln, he does not consider to be of any great military genius, and obviously he thinks very highly of himself, so he's not taking any suggestions from Lincoln. Likewise, he's really not telling anyone his plan. His plan is to move the base of operations from Washington, D.C. to a, a place called Urbana, which is on the Rappahannock River. So this is the big idea. He's going to try to flank Joseph Johnson's army, uh, and that's going to be his move toward Richmond. Well, it, it's not until January of 1862 that McClellan was accused of being a traitor, so that kind of prompts him to present this plan to Lincoln. Lincoln, on the other hand, meets with the senior officers of the army, and he has them take a look at the plan, and he has a conversations with them, and then he has them vote on whether they think it's a good idea. And ultimately, it does end up passing 8-4 to four in favor of McClellan's Urbana plan. Now, some of the officers that we will get to know uh, a little bit later here actually do owe their positions to McClellan, so it's, it's more like uh, they're supporting their guy, right? But Lincoln, on the other hand, for this core system that we talked about, he takes some of the generals who voted against it, and then he turns around and makes them the core commanders that are going to be working you know, most closely with uh, McClellan. So that's kind of an interesting little tidbit there is that he's using McDowell, Sumner, Heinzelman. These are, ex with the exception, I guess, of Irvin McDowell, they're a little bit older army generals. Um, they're probably not going to work very well with McClellan, but he has them become the core commanders. Um, so this is going to happen early in January of 1862 when we finally get a better picture of what the Army of the Potomac will become. Let's switch gears just a little bit and talk about what soldiers ate. As the saying goes, an army marches on its stomach, a saying that could also be true for Civil War podcasters. Just imagine the lampooning that would be handed out to McClellan on an empty stomach, let me tell you. Anywho, when one thinks of Civil War food, they talk mostly about hardtack. Hardtack was a bread ration used by both sides during the war. Invented by Josiah Bent in 1801, it was known as a water cracker, reason being you mixed flour and water. Bent was determined to make something that would last on longer sea voyages, tack actually coming from a slang word British sailors use for food. Much like the famous Lambus bread from The Lord of the Rings, the appeal in hardtack was that it was edible for a long period of time. In fact, the longevity of hardtack is incredible. There are certain museums that have hardtack preserved from the Civil War. However, if you are wondering why it is called hardtack, then yeah, it's going to be a little on the durable side, shall we say. Soldiers often called them maggot castles if they were not kept properly. Because of the strength and the potential for infestation, they would often break the cracker and boil it in hot water or coffee. The average ration for soldiers, mostly in the north, it should be said, was one pound of meat and one pound of bread. The meat was usually pork or salt pork, done so for preservation purposes. It was also known as salt horse, speaking more toward the taste as one can imagine. Soldiers did receive 
some hot bread, usually in winter quarters. In fact, Joseph Hooker, when he takes over command for the Army of the Potomac, will make this a common practice for the Union troops during the winter encampment. An interesting difference in the diets of the Union and Confederate forces was that the rebels would often have more corn in their diet due to the prevalence of that crop in the southern states. This kind of makes sense, right? Sort of like that wool versus cotton thing we talked about a while back. Let's also mention the importance of coffee, something very close to my heart. Coffee was important for the purposes of energy, but I do not think I really have to tell you all that. It was also important because it was a far safer option than some of the drinking water. Remember that in winter quarters, winter encampments, drinking water had the possibility of becoming contaminated with waste. Here is a quote from a New York recruit about that coffee, though. Again, we sat down beside the campfire for supper and consisted of hard pilot bread, raw pork, and coffee. The coffee you probably wouldn't recognize in New York, boiled in an open kettle, and about the color of a brownstone front, it was nevertheless the only warm thing we had. So there you go, a ringing endorsement about Civil War coffee. Confederates who did not get coffee would often boil roots to make a coffee-adjacent drink. Due to shortages, officers might use their own rations to help supplement the diet of their troops. I think we may have pointed out in our Sam Watkins memoir review that the Confederates were not as well fed. There was one particular incident involving a rat that I will not get into, but given the subject matter, I bet you can figure out exactly how that one ends. To learn more, though, here is a shameless plug for the Patreon feed, so check it out. And this is just a little reminder in the middle of the episode this time, something a little bit different, that... We do have a Patreon episode for this month posted, John O. Kassler's Four Years in the Stonewall Brigade. So if that is something that interests you, make sure to check that out. In many circumstances, the troops would forage for food to supplement their diet. Supply shortages were common toward the end of the war. In fact, one of Lee's objectives in Gettysburg was to secure supplies, drawing off resources in the Northern Territories, as opposed to continue to sap their own friendly territory. We have mentioned before that the lack of proper diet would lead to the deaths of many soldiers throughout the war. We might go ahead and revisit more about food throughout the war, but for now, this is a good snapshot of what the average soldier would be looking at. Now, let's head over to Kentucky and see what's going on there. In November of 1861, the Army of the Ohio, operating in Kentucky, was taken over by one Don Carlos Buell. Let's introduce Buell briefly, because I think he's an interesting character. In researching his name, I have found he was named after his uncle, also Don Carlos Buell. How did his uncle get that name? I'm not really sure. Buell was born in Ohio and attends West Point before serving in Florida and the Mexican-American War. In fact, he is wounded in the assault on Churubusco. After that conflict, and immediately prior to the Civil War, he served in the Pacific Theater. Making a brief stop in the Shenandoah, Buell would shift to Washington, D.C., and help the training and formation of the Army of the Potomac. McClellan would reward Buell with command of the Army of Ohio. The Ohio-born general would participate in the Battle of Shiloh and be responsible eventually for stopping Bragg at Perryville. Lack of an immediate response would doom Buell, and he does not come in again for the rest of the war, making him an interesting case, I think. In December of 1861, Albert Sidney Johnson was sitting with his forces at Bowling Green. Separation from the Federals was created via a defense line along the Green River near Munfordville, Kentucky. To create more of that separation would mean severing any potential crossing of that river. 
including a railroad bridge for the Nashville and Louisville Railroad. The Union forces would wish to repair the bridge. At the site, they would set up a temporary pontoon. Now, in case you aren't aware, a pontoon bridge floats on the water. During the Civil War, pontoon boats would be strung together with wooden platforms on top to create a walkway. Now, there will be a more famous incident involving pontoon bridges, but that will have to wait until 1862. In Kentucky, in December of 1861, there would need to be a beachhead to provide protection for the engineers repairing the railroad bridge. This came in the form of the 32nd Indiana from Alexander McCook's brigade. The 32nd was commanded by former Prussian military officer August Willick. The reason being was that the 32nd was made up primarily of German immigrants. It is interesting in the memoir Company H by Sam Watkins, he mentions going on an infiltration mission where he comes across a unit in the Union Army that only spoke German. This could have been that unit, perhaps, although it must be said they were not the only regiment that probably spoke primarily German. Willick was specifically asked by the governor of Indiana to head the unit due to his military experience and familiarity with the culture of the men. The 32nd Indiana would send several companies forward and come into contact with men under the command of Thomas C. Heinemann on the 17th. Heinemann was born in Tennessee before relocating to Arkansas. It is there that he practiced law with key Irish Confederate figure Patrick Claiborne. Thomas serves in the Mexican-American War, enlisting as a private, but rising to the rank of lieutenant. He will operate in the Western Theater of the war, eventually being severely wounded at Kennesaw Mountain. Being partially blind, this would take Heinemann out of the war. Not receiving a pardon from Andrew Johnson, Heinemann and his family would withdraw into Mexico for a time before returning to Arkansas in 1868. It was in 1868 that Thomas C. Heinemann was assassinated for his outspoken views conforming to the suffrage of African Americans. Heinemann's command would include a unit of cavalry, the 8th Texas. It would be after the Battle of Roulette Station that this unit would be renamed Terry's Texas Rangers, adopting the name of their commanding officer who would be killed in the fighting. The Texans would be armed with shotguns and revolvers and serve with distinction throughout the war in the West. The 8th would participate in what is most likely the last cavalry charge for the Confederacy in the war at Bentonville, North Carolina. In 1861, they would assault the Indiana troops in repeated charges. I have seen it recorded that the Indiana men would form a hollow square in response to the attacks. This would be an interesting thing to see, and very reminiscent of the Napoleonic era, perhaps drilled by their Prussian commanding officer, although Willick was not present for the engagement. It was during these assaults that Benjamin Terry was mortally wounded. Eventually, infantry support from Heinemann's troops would force the Indiana men to withdraw. This was another situation where both sides claimed victory. Casualties again were relatively light, with 50 or so Federal and 90-some on the side of the Confederates. We can classify Robot Station into another battle where both sides are posturing for better positions, sort of feeling each other out. A monument was erected to the fallen German soldiers in 1867, which is possibly the oldest Civil War monument in the United States. I know we did not have too much going on this week, but we will go ahead and put a pause right there. We have some smaller scale events we'll talk about to round out the year, but those should be a little more on the light side too. This week, we went over the Army of the Potomac, Civil War food, and the Battle of Roulette Station. <laughs>
Next week, I would like to talk about Civil War medals, especially the Medal of Honor. We will also talk about the Battle of Drainsville in Virginia as well, which, although is one you probably haven't heard of, was pretty important to close out 1861 in terms of morale for the Union in the East. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, and Venmo. Support for the general upkeep of the show would be welcomed. Once again, feedback is appreciated. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.